Hello guys, welcome to a new chapter of the future of humanity. Today we are going to be discussing about advanced civilizations. The tabloid headlines blurred, giant alien megastructure found in space, astronomers baffled by aliens machine in space, even the Washington Post not using to run in lurid stories on UFOs and aliens ran the headline, the weirdest star in the sky is acting up again. Suddenly astronomers who normally analyze boring reams of data from satellites and radio telescopes were flooded with calls from anxious journalists, asking if it was true that they had finally found an alien structure in space. This caught them by surprise. The astronomical community was at a loss for words. Yes, something strange had been discovered in space. Yes, it defied explanation, but it was too soon to say what it meant. This might just be a wild goose chase. The controversy began when astronomers were looking at exoplanets transiting distant stars, usually a giant-sized exoplanet moving in front of its mother star will dim its starlight by 1% or so, but one day they were analyzing the data from the Kepler spacecraft concerning the star Kik 8462852, which is about 1400 light years away. They found an astonishing anomaly, something had dimmed the starlight by a massive 15% in 2011. These anomalies can usually be dismissed, perhaps there was something wrong with the instruments, a spike in power, a transient surge in electrical output, or perhaps it was nothing but dust on the telescope mirrors. But then it was observed a second time in 2013, this time dimming the starlight by 22%. Nothing known to science can dim a starlight regularly by that amount. We had never seen anything like this star, it was really weird, said Tabitha Boyabjian, a postdoctoral fellow at Yale. The situation became even more bizarre when Bradley Schaffer of Louisiana State University searched all photographic plates and found that the star's light had been dimming periodically since 1890. Astronomic Now magazine wrote that this has triggered a frenzy of observations as astronomers hurry to try to get to the bottom of what is rapidly becoming one of the biggest mysteries in astronomy. So astronomers made long lists of possible explanations, but one by one, doubt was cast on the usual scientific suspects. What pool could possibly cause this massive dip in a starlight? Could it really be something 22 times larger than Jupiter? One possibility was that it was caused by a planet plunging into the star, but that was ruled out because the anomaly kept reappearing. Another possibility was the dust from the disk on the solar system. As a solar system condenses in space, the original disk of gas and dust can be many times larger than the sun itself. So maybe the dimming of a starlight occurred because the disk passed in front of the star, but this was ruled out when analyzing the star itself, which was found to be mature. The dust should have long since condensed or been swept into space by the solar winds. After discarding a number of possible solutions, there was still one option that could not be easily dismissed. No one wanted to believe it, but it could not be ruled out. Maybe it was a colossal megastructure built by an alien intelligence. Aliens should always be the very last hypothesis you consider, but this looked like something you would expect an alien civilization to build, says Jason Wright, an astronomer from Penn State University. Since the time elapsed between dips and starlight between 2011 and 2013 was 750 days, astronomers predicted that it would record again in May 2017. Right on schedule, the star began to dim. This time, practically every telescope on Earth capable of measuring a starlight was tracking the star. Astronomers from around the world witnessed the star dimming by 3% and then brightening again. But what could it be? Some thought it might be a Dyson sphere, first proposed by Olaf Stapledon in 1937, but later analyzed by physicist Freeman Dyson. A Dyson sphere is a gigantic sphere around a star, designed to harvest the energy from its massive amount of starlight. Or it could be a huge sphere orbiting a star that periodically passes in front of the star, causing a starlight to dim. Perhaps this was something created in order to power the machines of an advanced Type II civilization. This classification of advanced civilizations was first proposed by Russian astronomer Nikolai Kardashev in 1964. He was not satisfied looking for alien civilizations without any idea of what he might be searching for. Scientists like to quantify the unknown, so he introduced a scale that ranks civilizations on the basis of energy consumption. Different ones might have different cultures, politics and history, but all of them would require energy. A type 1 civilization utilizes all the energy of the sunlight that falls on that planet. 
A type 2 civilization utilizes all the energy its sun produces. A type 3 civilization utilizes the energy of an entire galaxy. In this way, Kardashev conveniently gave a simple method for computing and ranking the possible civilizations within the galaxy based on energy use. Each civilization in turn has an energy consumption that can be computed. It is easy to calculate how much sunlight falls on a square foot of land on Earth. Multiplying this by the surface area of the Earth illuminated by the Sun, and one immediately calculates the approximate energy of an average one type 1 civilization. We find that a type 1 civilization harnesses the power of 10 times 10 to the 17 watts, which is about 100,000 times the energy output of the Earth today. Since we know the fraction of the Sun's energy that falls on the Earth, we can then multiply to include the surface area of the entire Sun, and we get its total energy output, which is roughly 4 times 10 to the 26 watts. This tells us roughly how much energy is utilized in a Type 2 civilization. We also know how many stars there are in the Milky Way galaxy, so we can multiply by this number and find the energy output of an entire galaxy, giving us the energy consumption of a Type 3 civilization in our galaxy, which is roughly 4 times 10 to the 37 watts. The results were intriguing. Kardashev found that each civilization was greater than the previous one by a factor of between 10 billion and 100 billion. One can then mathematically compute when we might raise up this scale. Using the total energy consumption of the planet Earth, we find that we are currently at type 0.7 civilization. Assuming a 2-3% to annual increase in energy output, which roughly corresponds to the current average growth rate or annual growth in GDP for the planet, we're about a century or two from becoming a type 1 civilization. Rising to the level of type 2 civilization could take a few thousand years according to this calculation. When we will become a type 3 civilization is more difficult to compute, since it involves advances in stellar travel that are difficult to predict. By one estimate will probably not become a type 3 civilization for 100,000 and possibly not for a million years. Of all the transitions, perhaps the most difficult is the transition from Type 0 to Type 1, which we are undergoing at present. This is because a Type 0 civilization is the most uncivilized, both technologically and socially. It has risen only recently from the swamp of sectarianism, dictatorship and religious strife, etc. It still has all the scars from its brutal past, which was full of inquisitions, persecutions, pogroms and wars. Our own history books are full of horrid tales of massacres and genocide, much of it driven by superstition, ignorance, hysteria and hatred. But we are witnessing the birth pangs of a type 1 civilization based on science and prosperity. We see the seeds of this momentous transition germinating every day before our eyes. Already a planetary language is being born. The internet itself is nothing but a type 1 phone system, so the internet is the first type 1 technology to develop. We are also witnessing the emergence of a planetary culture. In sports we see the rise of soccer and the Olympics. In music we see the rise of global stars. In fashion we see the same high-end stores and brands at all the elite malls. Some fear that this process will threaten local cultures and customs, but in most third world countries today the elites are bilingual, fluent in the local language and also a global European language or Mandarin as well. In the future people will likely be bicultural, fluent in all the customs of the local culture but also at ease with emerging planetary culture. So the richness and diversity of Earth will survive even as this new planetary culture arises. Now that we have classified civilizations in space, we can use this to help calculate the number of advanced civilizations in the galaxy. For example, if we apply the Drake equation to a type 1 civilization to estimate how plentiful they might be in the galaxy, it would appear they should be quite common, yet we see no obvious evidence of them. Why? There are several possibilities. Elon Musk has speculated that, as civilizations master advanced technology, they develop the power to destroy themselves and that the biggest threat facing a type 1 civilization may be said the self-inflicted one. For us there are a few several challenges as we make the transition from type 0 to type 1. Global warming, bioterrorism and nuclear proliferation to name a few. The first and most immediate is nuclear proliferation. The bomb is spreading into some of the most unstable regions of the world, such as the Middle East, the Indian subcontinent and the Korean Peninsula. Even small countries may one day have the ability to develop nuclear weapons. In the past it took a large nation state to refine uranium ore into weapons grade materials. Gigantic gaseous diffusion plants and banks, banks of ultra centrifuge were required. These enrichment facilities were so large they could be easily seen 
by a satellite. This was beyond the reach of small nations, but blueprints for nuclear weapons have been stolen and then sold to unstable regimes. The cost of ultra centrifuge and purifying uranium into weapons grade material has fallen. As a result, even nations like North Korea, which is perpetually tethering on the brink of collapse, can amass a small but deadly nuclear arsenal. Now the danger is that a regional war between India and Pakistan, say, could escalate to a major war, drawing into the major nuclear powers. Since the United States and Russia each possesses about 7,000 nuclear weapons, this threat is significant. There is even a concern that non-state actors or terrorist groups could procure a nuclear bomb. The Pentagon commissioned a report from the Global Business Network, think tank that analyzed what might happen if global warming destroys the economies of many poor nations such as Bangladesh. It concluded that in the worst case scenario, nations may use nuclear weapons to protect their borders from being overrun by a food flood of the millions of desperate and starving refugees, and even if it does not cause a nuclear war, global warming is an existential threat to humanity. Since the end of the last glacial period, about 10,000 years ago, the Earth has been gradually warming up. However, over the past half a century, the Earth has been heating at an alarming and accelerating rate. We see evidence of this on numerous fronts. Every major glacier on Earth is receding, the northern polar ice has thinned by an average of 50% over the past 50 years, large parts of Greenland which is covered by the world's second largest ice sheet are throwing out, a section of Antarctica the size of Delaware, the Larsen Ice Shelf Sea broke off in 2017, and the stability of the ice sheets and ice shelves is now in question. The last few years have been the hottest ever recorded in human history. The Earth's average temperature has increased by about 1.3 degrees Celsius in the past century. On average, summer is about one week longer than it was in the past. We are seeing more and more 100-year events such as forest fires, floods, droughts and hurricanes. There is the danger that if this global warming accelerates unabated into the coming decades, it could destabilize the nations of the world, create mass starvation, generate mass migration from the coastal areas, and threaten the world economy to prevent the transition to a type 1 civilization. There is also the threat of weaponized biogems that could potentially wipe out 98% of the human population. Throughout world history, the greatest killers have not been wars, but plagues and epidemics. Unfortunately, it is possible that nations have kept secret stock piles of deadly diseases such as smallpox, which could be weaponized using biotechnology to create havoc. There is also the danger that someone could create a doomsday weapon by bioengineering some existing disease, and making it more lethal or causing it to spread more quickly and easily. Perhaps in the future, if we ever venture to other planets, we may find the ashes of dead civilizations, planets whose atmospheres are highly radioactive, planets that are too hot because of a runway greenhouse effect, or planets with empty cities because they used advanced biotech weaponry on themselves. A key question is whether a type 1 civilization can make the transition to energy sources other than fossil fuels. One possibility is to harness uranium nuclear power, but uranium fuel for a conventional nuclear reactor creates large amounts of nuclear waste products, which are radioactive for millions of years. Even today, 50 years into the nuclear age, we still do not have a safe way to store high-level nuclear waste. This material is also quite hot and create, can create a meltdown, as we have seen in the Chernobyl and Fukushima disasters. Disasters. An alternative to uranium fission power is fusion power, which as we saw in chapter 8, is not ready yet for commercial use, but a type 1 civilization a century more advanced than ours may have perfected the technology and could use it as an indispensable source of near unlimited energy. One advantage of fusion power is that its fuel is hydrogen, which can be extracted from seawater. A fusion plant can also not suffer a catastrophic meltdown like the ones we saw at Chernobyl and Fukushima. If there is a malfunction in the fusion plant, the fusion process automatically shuts itself off. Also, a fusion reactor only produces modest amounts of nuclear waste, because neutrons are created in the process of fusing hydrogen. These neutrons can irradiate the steel of the reactor, making it slightly radioactive. 
but the amount of waste created in this fashion is only a tiny fraction of that generated by uranium reactors. In addition to fusion power, there are other possible renewable energy sources. One attractive possibility for a Taiwan civilization is to exploit space-based solar energy. Since 60% of the energy of the sun is lost passing through the atmosphere, satellites could harness much more solar energy than collectors on the surface of the Earth. A space-based solar energy system might consist of many huge mirrors orbiting the Earth collecting sunlight. They will be geostationary and this energy can then be beamed down to a receiving station on the Earth in the form of microwave radiation and it will then be distributed through a traditional electrical grid. There are many advantages to space solar energy. It is clean and without waste products. It can generate power 24 hours a day, rather than just daylight hours. The solar panels have no moving parts, which vastly reduces breakdowns and repair costs. And best of all, solar power taps into a limitless supply of free energy from the sun. Every scientific panel that has looked into the question of space solar has concluded that the goal is achievable with the off-shelf technology, but the main problem like all endeavors involving space travel is cost. Simple estimates show that this is currently many times more expensive than simply putting solar panels out in our backyard. Solar power energy in space is beyond the means of a type 0 civilization like ours, but it become a natural source for a type 1 civilization for several reasons. The cost of space travel is dropping, especially because of the introduction of private rocket companies and the invention of reusable rockets. The space elevator may be possible later in the century. Space solar panels can be made of lightweight nanomaterials, keeping weight and cost down. The solar satellites can be assembled in space by robots, eliminating the need for astronauts. In, it is also in general considered safe because while microwaves can be harmful, calculations show that most of the energy is confined within the beam, and the energy that escapes outside of the beam should fall within accepted environmental standards. Eventually, a Taiwan civilization may exhaust the power available on its home planet and look to exploit the enormous energy found in the sun itself. A type 2 civilization should be easy to find, because they are likely immortal. Nothing known to science can destroy their culture. Meteor or asteroid collisions can be avoided using rocketry. The greenhouse effect can be avoided using hydrogen-based or solar technologies. If there are any planetary threats, they can even leave their home in large space armadas. They might even be able to move their planet if necessary. Since they have enough energy to deflect asteroids, they can whip them around their planet, causing a small shift in its trajectory. With uh, successive slingshot maneuvers, they could move the orbit of their planet further from the sun if their star is late in its life cycle and beginning to expand. To supply energy for their civilization, they might, as we mentioned earlier, build a Dyson sphere to harvest most of the energy from the sun itself. The number of space missions needed to create such megastructures is truly mo monumental, but the key to building them may be to utilize space-based robots and self-organizing materials. For example, if a nanofactory could be built on the moon to make panels for the Dyson Sphere, they could be assembled in outer space, because these robots are self-replicating and almost unlimited number of them could be built to create this structure. But even if a type 2 civilization is virtually immortal, it still faces a long-term threat, the second law of thermodynamics, the fact that all their machines will create enough infrared radiation to make life impossible on their planet. The second law says that entropy always increases in a closed system. In this case, every machine, every appliance, every apparatus generating waste in the form of heat. Naively, we can assume that the solution is to build gigantic refrigerators to cool down the planet. These refrigerators do in fact lack the power of the temperature inside them, but if we add everything up, including heat from the motors used by the refrigerators, the average heat of the whole system still increases. A type 2 civilization in order to survive the second law may necessarily have to disperse its machinery or overheat. As we discussed earlier, one solution will be to move most of the machinery to outer space so that the mother planet becomes a park. This means that a type 2 civilization might build all its heat uh, generating equipment of the planet. Although it consumes the energy output of a star, the waste gen heat generated is in outer space and hence dissipates harmlessly. Eventually the Dyson Sphere itself begins to heat up. This means that a Dyson Sphere must be necessarily emitting infrared radiation. Scientists have scanned the heavens looking for the telltale signs of infrared radiation from a type 2 civilization, and they have failed to find it. Scientists that 
Fermilab outside Chicago scanned 250,000 stars looking for signatures of a type 2 civilization but only found four that were amusing but still questionable. So the results were inconclusive. It is possible that the James Webb Space Telescope, which is already up in space, can look to find this infrared radiation. So this is a mystery. If type 2 civilizations are virtually immortal and they necessarily emit waste infrared radiation, then why haven't we detected them? Perhaps looking for infrared emissions is too narrow. Astronomer Chris M.P. at the University of Arizona commenting on finding a type 2 civilization has written, The premise is that any highly advanced civilization will leave a much larger footprint than we will. Type 2 or later civilizations may employ technologies that we are tinkering with or can barely imagine. They might orchestrate stellar cataclysms or use propulsion by antimatter. They might manipulate space-time to create wormholes or baby universes and communicate by gravity waves. Or as David Greenspoon has written, logic tells me that it is reasonable to look for godlike signs of advanced aliens in the sky, and yet the idea seems ridiculous. It is both logical and absurd. Go figure. One possible way out of this dilemma is to realize that there are two ways to rank a civilization by its energy consumption, but also by its information consumption. Modern society has expanded in the direction of miniaturization and energy, energy efficiency as it consumes an exploding amount of information. In fact, Carl Sagan proposed a way to rank civilizations by information. In this scenario, a type A civilization consumes a million bits of information. A type B civilization will consume 10 times that number or 10 million bits of information and so on until we hit type Z, which can consume an astounding 10 to the 31 bits of information. By this calculation, we're a type H civilization. The point here is that civilizations may advance on the scale of information consumption while consuming the same amount of energy, thus they may not produce a significant amount of infrared radiation. We see an example of this when we visit a science museum. We are amazed at the size of the machines of the industrial revolution with gigantic locomotives and huge steamboats. We will also notice how inefficient they were, generating a large amount of waste heat. Similarly, the gigantic computer banks of the 1950s can be surpassed by an ordinary cell phone today. Modern technology became much more sophisticated, intelligent and less wasteful of energy. So a type 2 civilization can consume a vast amount of energy without burning up by distributing their machines in Dyson, Dyson spheres, on asteroids and nearby planets, or by creating super-efficient miniaturized computer systems. Instead of being consumed by the heat generated by their huge energy usage, their technology may also be super-efficient, consuming vast amounts of information and producing very little waste. There are limitations, however, to how far each civilization will advance in terms of space travel. For example, a Type 1 civilization, as we have seen, is limited by its planetary energy. At best, it will master the art of terraforming a planet like Mars and begin to explore the nearest stars. Robotic probes will begin exploring nearby solar systems, and perhaps the first astronauts will be sent to the nearest star, like Proxima Centauri. But its technological and its economy uh, are not sufficiently advanced to begin the systematic colonization of scores of nearby star systems. For a type 2 civilization, which is centuries to millennia more advanced, colonization of a sector like the Milky Way becomes a real possibility. But even for a type 2 civilization, eventually they are constrained by the light barrier. If we assume that faster than light propulsion is not available to them, it may take them many centuries to colonize their sector of the galaxy. But if it takes centuries to go from one system to another, then eventually the ties to the home world become extremely tenuous. Planets will eventually lose contact with other worlds, and new branches of humanity may emerge that can adapt to radically different environments. Colonies may also genetically and cybernetically modify themselves to adapt to the strange environments. Eventually, they may not feel any connection to the home planet. This seems to contradict the vision of Asimov in his Foundation series, with a galactic empire emerging 50,000 years from now that has colonized most of the galaxy. Can we reconcile these two very different visions of the future? Is the ultimate fate of human civilizations to splinter into smaller entities with only the sketchiest knowledge of one another? This raises the ultimate question. Will we again 
the stars would lose our humanity in the process and what does it mean to be human anyway if there are so many distinct branches of humanity. This divergence seems to be universal in nature, a common thread that runs through all of evolution, not just humanity. Darwin was the first to see how this occurs through the animal and plant kingdoms when he sketched a prophetic diagram in his notebook. He drew a picture of the branches of a tree with different arms diverging into smaller branches. In one simple diagram he drew the tree of life, with all the diversity of nature evolving from a single species. Perhaps this diagram applies not only to life on earth but to humanity itself thousands of years from now, when we become a type 2 civilization capable of colonizing the nearby stars. To gain some concrete insight into this problem, we have to reanalyze our own evolution. Looking at the sweep of human history, we can see that roughly 75,000 years ago, a great diaspora took place, with small bands of humans moving away from Africa through the Middle East, creating settlements along the way perhaps driven by ecological disasters such as the Toba eruption and a glaciation period. One of the main branches went through the Middle East and journeyed to Central, Central Asia. Then this migration split further into smaller branches and about 40,000 years ago. One branch kept on going east and eventually settled in Asia, forming the core of the modern Asian people. The other branch turned around and went into Northern Europe, eventually becoming Caucasian. Yet another branch went southeast and eventually passed through India and into Southeast Asia and then Australia. Today we see the consequences of this great diaspora. We see a variety of humans of different colors, sizes, shapes and cultures who have no ancestral memory of their true origins. One can even calculate roughly how divergent the human race is. If we assume that one generation is 20 years long, then at most about 3,500 500 generations separate any two humans on the planet. But today, tens of thousands of years later, with modern technology, we can begin to recreate all the migration routes of the past and build an ancestral family tree of human migrations over the past 75,000 years. I had a vivid demonstration of this while hosting a BBC TV science special about the nature of time. The BBC took some of my DNA and sequenced it. Four of my genes were then carefully compared with the genes of thousands of other individuals around the world, looking for a match. Then the location of the people who matched these four genes were identified on a map. The results were rather interesting. It showed a concentration of people scattered through Japan and China who had a match, but then there was a thin trail of dots that tapered off into the distance near the Gobi Desert through Tibet. So using DNA analysis it was possible to retrace the route that my ancestors took about 20,000 years ago. How far will humanity diverge over thousands of years? Will humanity be recognizable after tens of thousands of years of genetic separation? This question can actually be answered using DNA as a clock. Biologists have noticed that DNA mutates at roughly the same rate across the ages. For example, our closest evolutionary network is the chimpanzee. Analysis of the chimpanzee shows that we differ by approximately 4% of our DNA. Studies of chimpanzee and human fossils indicate that we separated from them about 6 million years ago. This means that our DNA mutated at the rate of 1% over a period of 1.5 million years. At, this is only an approximate number, but let us see if it can allow us to understand the ancient history of our own DNA. Assume for the moment that this rate of change is roughly constant. Now let us analyze the Neanderthal, our closest human-like kin. DNA and fossil analysis of the Neanderthal shows that their DNA differs from ours by about 0.5% and that we have separated from them roughly 500,000 to 1 million years ago. So this is in rough agreement with a DNA clock. If we now analyze the human race, we may find that any two humans chosen at random can differ in their DNA by 0.1%. Our clock then says that different branches began to diverge 150,000 years ago, which is in rough agreement with the actual origins of humanity. So given this DNA clock, we can calculate roughly when we diverge from the chimpanzees, the Neanderthals and also our fellow human beings. The point is that we can use this clock to estimate how far humanity will change in the future if we disperse throughout the galaxy and don't drastically tinker with our DNA. Assume for the moment that the, we remain a type 2 civilization with only sublight speed rockets for 100,000 years. 
Even if different human settlements lose all contact with other branches of humanity, this means humans will probably only diverge by about 0.1% in our DNA, which is the amount of divergence that we can already see today amongst humans. The conclusion here is that humanity, uh, as it spreads throughout the galaxy at sublight speed and different branches lose contact with other branches, we will still be basically human. Even after 100,000 years, when we might reasonably be expected to attain light speed, different human settlements elements will differ no more than any two humans on the earth today. This phenomenon also applies to the very language that we speak. Archaeologists and linguists have noticed that a startling pattern emerges when we try to trace the origin of language. They find that languages constantly branch out into other smaller dialects due to migrations. Over time, these new dialects become full-fledged languages themselves. If we create a vast tree of all known languages and how they branch off one another and compare it with ancestral tree detailing ancient migration routes, we find an identical pattern. For example, Iceland, which has been largely isolated from Europe since 874 AD, when the first Norwegian settlements began, can be used as a laboratory to test linguistic and genetic theories. The Icelandic language is closely related to the Norwegian language of the 9th century, with a little bit of a Scottish and Irish thrown in the mix. It is then possible to create a DNA clock and a linguistic clock to roughly calculate how much divergence there is over a thousand years. Even after a thousand years, one can easily find evidence of ancient migration patterns imprinted in their language. But even if our own DNA and language still resemble themselves after thousands of years of separation, what about our culture and our beliefs? Will we be able to understand and identify with these divergent cultures? When we look at the great diaspora and at the civilizations it has created, we see not only a variety of difference in skin color, size, hair, etc., but also a certain core set of characteristics that are remarkably the same across all cultures even when they lost all contact with one another for thousands of years. We see evidence of this today when we go to the movies. People of different races and cultures have diverged from us 70 5,000 years ago, but they still love, cry and thrill at the same moment in the film. Translators of foreign languages uh, notice the commonality of the jokes and humor in the movies around the languages themselves, that they diverged long ago. This also applies to our sense of aesthetics. If we visit an art museum that has exhibits from ancient civilizations, we see common themes. Regardless of the culture, we find artwork depicting landscape scenes. Another theme that cuts through uh, the barriers of space and time is our common social values. One core concern is for the welfare of others. This means kindness, generosity, friendship, etc. Various forms of the golden rule are found in numerous civilizations. Many of the religions of the world at the most fundamental level stress the same concepts such as charity and sympathy for the poor and unfortunate. The other core characteristic is focus not inward but outward. This includes curiosity, innovation, etc. Thus the caveman principle recognizes that our core personalities have not changed much in 200,000 years, so even as we spread among the stars, we will most likely retain our values and personal characteristics. Furthermore, psychologists have noted that there might be an image of what is attractive that, that is encoded in our brain. If we take photographs of hundreds of different people at random, and then using computers superimpose these pictures on top of one another, we see a composite average image that emerges. Surprisingly, this image is an average is considered by many to be attractive. If true, this implies that there is a um, average image that may be hardwired, hardwired into our brains that determines if a person's face is actually the norm and not the exception. But what happens when we finally attain type 3 status and have the capability of faster than light travel? Will we spread the values and aesthetics of our world across the galaxy?